come section c has got um 38 boys so right now we have only 27 so 11 boys are yet to come in i might as well start writing the attendance record because it will take some time let the boys come in in the meantime i'll take the attendance so 8078 8078 हिमानीश मुखर्जी वॉट इज योर नंबर ऑक्यूपाइड स्पेस एंड नो नंबर इज शोइंग ओके इंद्रजीत मैत्रो वॉट इज योर नंबर सर एट जीरो एट फाइव सर एट फाइव ओके देन यू हैव एट एट दैट मीन सम आर मिसिंग फ्रॉम देयर एट सिक्स एट सेवन आर मिसिंग कम एट सिक्स आर जस्ट कम एंड एट वन जीरो एट 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 अम एट सिक्स जय प्रकाश इज जस्ट कम एंड Next one eight 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 is there. Then Jayant Kumar Gurai, what's your number? Jayant Kumar Gurai has just signed in and he's gone off. Yes, sir. Eight zero nine zero. Eight zero nine zero. Okay. Yes, sir. Eight zero nine zero. Next is Kartikesh. Eight zero nine four. Nine four. That means nine one, nine two, nine three are missing. So nine four is there. After that is Karunathan, Karutharan, Ashwin. What's your number? Sir, eight zero nine five. Eight zero nine five. Okay. Next is uh, Kita. Eight zero nine six is there. And then is eight, uh, Khalid Yaya Ahmed. What's your number? Yes, sir. Eight zero nine seven, sir. Eight zero nine seven. Then is nine eight. Okay, I can see nine eight clearly. Then I have eight thousand one hundred. Okay, that's clearly visible. One zero one, one zero one. Then you have Kundan Kumar Sharma. What's your number? Sir, one zero two. Eight one zero two. Then I can see one zero three. Then I can see one zero four, one zero five, one zero six, one zero five, one zero six. Then it, Manish Kumar Yadav. What's your number? Sir, eight one zero seven. Eight one zero seven. One zero eight. Manohar Singh. I can see already. Muhammad Azharuddin Khan. Your one zero nine. Yes, sir. One zero nine. Then uh, Agdis eight one one eight triple one. Faran, are you doing some research on that pilot's ladder? Yes, sir. Sir, I have just started uh, like on the introduction and what's it all about. I just started mm -hmm. on the scratch, sir. Yes, because you'll have to do a little research. I can't give you any information. I don't think anybody can, any of us can give you information. We we'll have to yes. get into the studies, find out details, and find out alternative means to pilot's ladder. That is the whole objective. What other yes. safe options can you think about to make a mention of it? Good. It's a good practice. You have a nice opportunity to make yourself seen in the uh, maritime world. Eight triple one one two. Then you have eight one one five. Eight one one six. I think most of the boys are there. We have thirty two here. Okay, two four six eight ten twelve fourteen sixteen eighteen twenty twenty two twenty four twenty six twenty seven twenty eight twenty nine thirty. Correct. So I have thirty over here, and the others are missing. So if All of you, you know, you are being recorded. Those who have not been recorded, I'll have to mark them as absent. Anyway, today what we are going to go into a new subject area, and that is there in your syllabus. But I would also point out that this particular area 
is not given to much of questions in your examinations but you need to be aware of what is required of you to know and have some idea of what it is because it is more related to an actual experience this kind of a subject c trials what happens in c trials it is best experienced rather than mugged up from a book or given a lecture on it so if at all at any time during your c career you get an opportunity to join a ship while it is in shipyard for taking delivery grab it because it's a once in a lifetime experience that you will have and it will be something to remember and it will be something to learn about how a ship is taken over once it is constructed only drawback is you will not get the article and sea time See, when you join ship there are two times that are marked on your cdc and a letter or a certificate that you get from the captain and chief engineer when you are leaving the ship and on that certificate it will be stated how much of article time you have done that means from the day you have signed on till the day you have left the ship there comes a new boy what is number 8110 okay 8110 is coming so that is called article time the day you sign on till the day you leave say 6 months 25 days that is article time now from this article time you must must have two thirds of the time as propelling time that means that is the time or the duration for which the propeller has been turning so if you have spent exactly 6 months on the ship four months should be when your propeller was turning 8113 has come in that is called propelling time so when you go for an exam mmd examination they will check whether you have the requisite propelling time because i will tell you what is the reason if you have 6 months on the ship and all 6 months the ship has been alongside a harbor or it has been left in anchorage that means you have learnt nothing really you have not seen the engine running to run the propeller you have not been out at sea really you have been out in anchorage but you have not been out at sea so you don't have the requisite experience for going on board the ship you can go on board the ship and stay in anchorage for 6 months no propelling time that means you have learned nothing the objective is to ensure that you have learned something while you were on the ship so that is why they have such a thing called propelling time that also has to be recorded in your certificate the time for which the propeller has been turning so that you have learned something about the main engine running get the point and this time should be two thirds of the article time this is something you will miss out if you go to join a ship if it is brand new that means you are going to the shipyard and probably you will be staying in the shipyard for three months familiarizing yourself oh he is already there so you will be familiarizing yourself so that time you are neither getting article time nor you are getting propeller time article time will be while you are signed on on the ship but when you go to take over a ship from a shipyard you are not going to be signed on on the ship because the ship has not yet been commissioned only after the ship has been commissioned can you get and you are signed on the ship you start getting your article time so this is the only drawback but it doesn't make much of a difference really so what if you lose out on a little bit of article time and sailing time you are learning something about how to take over a ship and what happens during sea trials the whole experience is something precious to you and it will remain with you all your life so it is well worth it even if you get delayed for your examination that mmd by 3 4 months it doesn't make any difference you are richer in the experience of having taken over a new ship and possibly at a later date when you are a chief engineer when article time and propelling time does not make any difference to you you will be much happier to be taking over ships learning the new technologies that have been implemented in the ship and so on so forth because that time you will be more in the managerial cadre and the whole idea of spanners and hammers and making machines work is behind you 
He will be doing more of man, man management. That means guiding second engineers and other engineers how to go about doing your work. So that time it won't matter whether you're getting article time or sea time, but the rich experience of taking over a ship from a shipyard will be something to cherish. Okay. So right now, today we are going to discuss the subject of sea trials. Now, uh, okay, let's start getting to the thick of it because once I start talking, I can't stop. And then I start talking beyond what the subject is. Because we need to finish this chapter in two classes, today and the next one. And we should finish with sea trials. After that, we will go into lubrication of marine diesel engines. And that is definitely much more important than the sea trial chapter. In any case, have a fair idea of what sea trials is about. Okay. Now, before I go on to the first page, what is the purpose of having a sea trial? See, the most important person related to a ship is the owner, is the ship owner. So when a ship owner purchases a ship from a shipyard, he has given a certain quotation to the shipyard that I want a ship which can carry 50,000 tons of cargo from point A to point B in such and such time. In other words, the ship must have a certain speed value. That speed has to be decided by the ship yard based on what is the design of the ship, how much cargo it is going to carry, and what is the power requirement to enable such a speed. So all these are left to the shipbuilder. So he will have to calculate what size engine he will have to put on the ship because the ship after loading will have to carry that cargo at a speed of say 15 knots. If it is below, if it cannot achieve 50 knots, then the shipbuilder will have to pay a penalty to the ship owner. Because he has asked for a ship which will give 50 knots, and the shipbuilder cannot give it, then he will have to pay. Because the ship owner, he has already decided on a certain cargo from some place to another place, and the time that is given for him to deliver that cargo. He has to fulfill those demands. So based on those demands, he needs a ship of a certain speed. Okay. So that has to be built on the basis of power of the engine that is installed on the ship. This is one side. If it is underpowered, then shipbuilder will pay a penalty. Now, if it is overpowered, now if it is overpowered, the ship owner is not going to give him extra payment for that extra power in that engine that he has built. Because the shipbuilder, by his uh, incorrect calculation, instead of putting a 10,000 kilowatt engine, he has put a 15,000 kilowatt engine. And that 15,000 kilowatt engine is giving him 20 knots. But that ship owner has not asked for 20 knots. Why should he pay for that extra 5,000 kilowatt power that has been input into the engine? It costs more money. So ultimately, that accuracy of getting the ship to run at a certain speed is of prime importance to the ship owner. And the shipbuilder's responsibility is to get the correct power for that ship. Okay. Now, theoretical calculations will give you 15 knots. Okay. But really out at sea, the conditions are different. This calculation of 15 knots is based on calm sea, no wind, no change in current, no resistance to movement. Those conditions don't really exist out at sea. So they have to keep a margin. While their calculation is 15 knots for those conditions, they will have to keep an extra margin, say 16.5 knots, with consideration of bad conditions out at sea. So these are the issues that come about to ensure that the sea trials will prove that the ship is capable of what the owner has demanded. Okay, so that is the concept. This is from the ship owner's point of view. From the ship builder's point of view, it is an experience. While he has built a ship, he will find out what are the errors that have come about, and accordingly for the next ship, he will make sure that there are no errors. Same for the designer. He designs the ship from scratch, and that design comes from a model. He makes a model and the parameters of that model are in proportion 
to a ship that is going to be built in a large capacity. Okay. This model has to be tested and it is tested by what is called International Towing Tank Conference. This is also another body of naval architects and engineers and they are the ones who make out the rules, regulations regarding ships' parameters and their proportions and also means of testing a ship after it is built. It is called ITTC. Uh, it, it will be there in the plates. You don't have to immediately get uh, start writing notes or something. I will explain it. This is to give you the gist of the entire subject so the rest of it becomes easy to follow. So this International Towing Tank Conference is a separate body and they do test, they at least write out, they don't do the testing themselves, but they write out the procedures for the testing that is to be done for a ship. And the number of tests that are done are enormous. But for cargo ships, we do not have to do all the tests that are there. But for other ships like warships, trawlers, shipping trawlers, and different types of ships, cargo uh, container carriers, maybe car carriers, they will also have this. So various types of ships will have various types of tests. You don't have to be thorough with all the tests. Maybe two or three tests are necessary for you able to recall and repeat if at all you are asked. Okay. This is from the ITTC part. And uh, okay, next we will go through whatever come by in our place. So let's have a look at the first place. Okay. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to write in the chat column. So, so I will be able to attend it. Uh, attend to it immediately. A ship owner enters into a contract with the shipbuilder for delivery of a vessel built to standards specified by a classification society with performance levels to fulfill demands of a successful sea transport venture. So that first sentence says everything that I told you. To fulfill demands of a successful sea transport venture. A ship owner wants to make profit. How? By transporting cargo from one country to another country or one port to another port. So he gets the payment for that. So this is his objective. Now he must have a ship which is capable of putting the transport across. It must not sink into the sea midway. It must not get damaged midway because of a little rough weather. So it has to be built to certain standards. And those standards are determined by a classification society. The classification society is another body which have their rules, regulations, procedures, engineers, naval architects, assistants, everything. So they are the ones who give the guidelines toward the construction of the ship, design of the ship, and its building process is continuously monitored right from the plans. Classification societies there are so many. There are about 105 different classification societies all over the world. But about 15 to 16 of them are very prominent ones. Among them, IRS, Indian Register of Shipping is one. Then you have American Bureau of Shipping. You have Lloyd's Register of Shipping. Then you have NKK, Japanese. You have Italian. You have French. You have Debt Norse Veritas from uh, Norway. So all the major countries have their own. For that matter, China, it has got three different classification societies. And all three are recognized by their government. Likewise, our Indian Register of Sh Shipping is a classification society which is recognized by the Indian government. Indian government also recognizes Lloyd's Register, American Bureau Register, then... Uh, um, Get North Veritas, all of these classification societies are recognized by the government. The government body is called the DG Shipping, Director General Shipping. And they are the ultimate authority. They give the authority to the classification society to do the checking, to do the monitoring, to do the inspection and submit reports to the government. And then DG Shipping will give permission based on the report submitted by the classification society. Get it? 
So that is how things work. The government by itself may or may not send its surveyors for inspection to the ship. It depends on how much authority the government has given to a classification society to conduct all the tests and procedures which are to be followed to maintain it to certain standards. Okay. So the contract is between ship owner and a ship builder. On completion, that means after the ship is built, the owner satisfies himself with confirming the attained speed and power through sea trials. That means the owner has to make sure that after the ship is built, that the ship is capable of attaining a certain speed. That it is capable of carrying 50,000 tons of cargo is evident by taking internal measurements of the tanks and cargo hold. So that doesn't require to be proved. It can be proved by taking the measurements inside the ship. So there you don't need really trials to put in 50,000 tons of cargo and see 50,000 cargo can fit. That is not required. But the speed, the performance of the ship has to be tested. You can make a very good ship based on your calculations. But ultimately, when you put it out at sea, it does not perform the way your calculations are supposed to show. That could happen. So that is why it is very necessary to have a sea trials of the ship. Okay. Failure to attain the specific speed as contracted by the ship owner is liable to penalty by the ship builder. This is one thing. He has... He is ready to pay the money for you to build a ship which can go at 15 knots. Now, when you build the ship, it is going at only 13 knots. Now, his objective of fulfilling a successful sea transport venture is going to fail. That is why he will be collecting a penalty from the ship builder. He may or may not take the ship. He may reject the ship. So, the ship builder has to buy, find a new buyer for that ship. And... If at all he takes the ship, he will have to get a poor quotation in the market for transportation. So all these things happen. I'm telling you what is only a tip of the iceberg. The real occurrences are much, much larger. You see, the contract itself will be like a thick telephone directory. It's a fat book and all the terms, conditions, requirements, specifications, everything is in that book of contract signing. Similarly, after sea trials, the results are also compiled in a fat manual and all records during the sea trials is recorded. And this serves as a reference value in the later dates of the ship's functioning. Whether it is main engine, whether it is cargo hold, whether it is auxiliary engine, whether it is anything. Every detail is recorded during the sea trials. Okay. So failure to attain the specific speed is liable to penalty. Similarly, excess power and speed results in extra cost input for which there is no return. It doesn't make sense to buy a pen. If your pen actually costs 10 rupees, you go and buy one pen for 100 rupees. But both the pens perform the same function. Maybe one is a little better than the other. But I have asked for a pen which is capable of writing within certain limits. Then you buy, give you a pen of 100 rupees or 90 rupees remain locked in that without giving you any other returns. So that is the concept actually. That you are implementing more power in the engine, but you are not using that power. So ultimately it is detrimental for that engine and it is a money that has been fed in which is not giving you any return. So that is also a loss. It has to be accurately what you require. Full-scale trials enable the designer to obtain data for estimates of power for future ships. Similarly, the designer who has designed the ship, he records the data, he gets the record of all the data, and then he finds that my theoretical values are coming to 15 knots. But in practice, it is coming to 14.7 knots. So I will have to change my calculation. So that ultimately I will get 15 knots or 15.1 knot or 15.05 knot. 
the limit for margin. You cannot get 100% accuracy between your calculations and actual practice. So there is a margin given, and that margin is 0 0.05 knots, where the speed of the ship is concerned, and 2% where the power is concerned. See, the power developed at sea is quite different from the power developed by the engine in the ship test bed trial. That means where the engine is manufactured, not on board the ship, but where the ship, where the engine is manufactured in say Sulzer workshops. In Sulzer workshops, when the engine is manufactured, they find out what is the power being made. But that power output on board the ship may be different by 2%, which is acceptable. Up to 2% variation in power from the quoted power is accepted. Maybe more, maybe less. Usually they try to keep it a little more, so there is no shortfall. Beyond 2%, it means wastage. So another reason for sea trials is to obtain the relationship between ship speed engine RPM and power. These must be managed, managed. So you need to match the engine power, the ship speed and <coughs> power. That's all three of them. RPM. Basically RPM means RPM of the propeller. Okay. Data collected is extremely useful as reference to the chief engineer in the years of service of the vessel. The data collected during sea trials is the reference figure for the chief engineer to refer to when he is actually doing maintenance of the ship 10 years, 15 years, 12 years, 5 years ahead of him. That means after the ship has been taken. Five years later, he is taking an indicator card and then he finds that the power is coming, but is it correct? So is it correct or is it accurate? Is it enough? He will have to refer to something. And that reference is from the reference manual for the sea trial. So what were the parameters obtained during sea trial? He tries to achieve those figures in terms of power, speed, etc. Because Sea trial figures are considered to be ideal. Why? Right? Because the ship is new, engine is new, everything is perfect, at least assumed to be perfect. So the performance of the engine is expected to be the best during sea trials. So that is taken as the reference value for all your maintenance work in future. Power values are obtained in indicated power through indicator cards. Of course, the more modern ships they have automatic sensor devices, etc., and immediately they are recorded. So everything is recorded on the computer. I can also show you instruments and tell you that these are instruments used and they are directly recorded in the computer. You don't have to do anything. So you sit tight on the in the engine engine control room, not knowing how to take the indicator cards. So that is not something we marine engineers would want to do. We need to know what happens beyond pressing the button. How the functioning takes place to do what the machine is doing after we press the button. It is not that marine engineers should know only how to press the button. You press the button and you get the results. It's not enough for the marine engineer. It's enough for a technician who is going to take records of the values. That's all. But you as an engineer will need to know why the values are what they are and how is it that pressing the button gets those values. That is what the marine engineer's expertise has to be. So power cards are taken by indicator card instruments like I showed you in my previous classes and the value is calculated. So how do you obtain the brake horsepower? The brake power is obtained actually in the test bed trial, that means where the engine has been built, either in Sulzer or in MAN or in BMW or in what any of these makers, 
they have what is called a brake dynamometer. The brake dynamometer will decide what is the power output at the shaft which is coming out from the engine. Indicated power is calculated from indicator cards, which is the power inside the combustion chamber. Power generated in the combustion of fuel. So that is indicated power. Then there are mechanical losses within the engine and what comes out is called the brake power. Now to obtain the mechanical efficiency of that engine, you need to divide the brake power by the indicated power. Everybody is aware of that. So you get a figure something like 0.88 or 0.9 or 0.92 to 0 0.92 is the mechanical efficiency of that particular engine. So that figure is given to the ship during sea trials. So during sea trials, they calculate the indicated power and multiply this efficiency number 0 0.88 with the indicated power to get the brake power. Okay. To get the shaft power, you need to use the torsion meter. The power that is finally reaching the end of the shaft. There won't be much of a difference between brake power and shaft power. Very small loss might be there and that is because the shaft is supported by a bearing. So whatever frictional wear takes place in that bearing, maybe one bearing, maybe two bearings, or if it is a long shaft, then of course, number of bearings will be more. So the losses will be more in the shaft power from the brake power. So a torsion meter is generally used to measure what is the shaft power. Now that is followed out by the amount of twist that takes place in the shaft. Why does it take twist? Because it is getting rotated under a torque and there is some resistance to its rotation. One is up to the propeller. Propeller is giving that resistance. So ultimately, the angle of twist on the shaft multiplied by the parameters that are there for calculating on strength of materials formula using mod modulus of rigidity of the shaft material. I don't remember the exact formula, but ultimately, shaft power can be obtained using modulus of rigidity, the speed at which it is turning. Both. And the angle of twist of the shaft. Those are your strength of material calculations and we can follow it up at some stage. So the sea trials is the testing phase of a ship and is conducted to measure the vessel's performance and general seaworthiness. That means how it will behave at sea, whether there will be excessive rolling, whether there will be excessive fatigue, whether there will be any excessive stresses within the component. See, there's another point which I've not mentioned here is of crucial importance in modern built ships. In the modern ship, they have sensors fitted in all parts of the hull, maybe hundred of them, all sensors fitted. And in fact, they are put in key locations, locations at which the maximum stresses are prone to occur. And these are actually strain gauges. These sensors ultimately check the stress on the hull material, on the frames of the hull, and they relay that stress directly to the bridge, not to the engine room. This is the responsibility of the deck officers to see how much the hull is being stressed during its cargo loading, during its bad weather, during any time, 24 hours, 24-7 continuous monitoring of the stress on the hull is referred to the bridge. During loading, you see, when the ship is being loaded with cargo, it is not that one hole is filled fully and then you go to the next cargo hole full, next you go to, it is not loaded like that. If that happens, then one part of the ship will be stressed much more than the rest and it will break. There are ships which are broken in the harbor because of incorrect loading and believe me, the whole hull fractures, breaks into two because of incorrect loading. See, after all, a ship, a big huge ship, it is made of steel no doubt, but because of its huge volume, that half inch thick steel plate is like paper. 
is like a paper board or maybe a little more tin board so what you have is a tin tin shell like that and that is going to take support of iron ore iron ore is very very heavy so if you load it at one point the whole thing is going to bend so it is very essential that you load cargo a little bit over here then you go to number one then you go to the last one then again come back to the center one between the second and third load here go back to the other one then load in the middle load here load here the so loading of the ship is also requires expertise it is not simply dumping cargo on the ship and everything is fine the loading of the ship has to be such that the stresses are even all along the hull and to ensure this you have various sensors fitted on the hull which have recording going directly to the bridge so on the bridge there you have a monitor which will display the stress levels at various parts of the ship based on that you can plan your cargo loading and cargo loading has to be planned before the cargo taking place so the cargo plans are submitted to the skip doors skip door is the person who is in charge of taking care of loading the cargo he is the one who is going to authorize those shore built cranes to do this and do that the deck officer has no authority over him he only can steal the skip door i think the head who is managing the entire loading of the ship so all these processes have to be followed on the ship to make sure that the ship does not get damaged the ship is like a thin shell so you have to be very you have to handle it like it's made of glass when it is being loaded it's not so robust and rigid though we try to make it as robust and rigid because large masses are concerned very huge masses okay it is the testing phase of a ship and conducted to measure the vessel's performance and general seaworthiness testing of the vessel's contractual guaranteed speed maneuverability equipment put on board safety features are the key functions usually conducted so these are the areas where most of the focus is and this is the third time that i'm repeating contractual guaranteed speed the speed of the ship is one of the most important parameters for the ship owner okay so that you got it the maneuverability equipment safety features these are standard but the ship builder ship owner he is looking at his profit his whole purpose of going into this commercial venture is making a profit so he is going to be very driving you very hard regarding the speed of the ship even when the ship is in service the mo most important responsibility of the chief engineer is to maintain the required rpm irrespective of the other conditions so the pressure will be on him continuously and this rpm can be achieved only if you keep the engine in good condition one one area i need to harp on see they i told you very narrow margins are permitted in the power of the engines the rpm and the size of the ship they should not go wayward too little is penalty too much is also a penalty so that has to be very accurate okay now here is an argument when the ship builds full power it is i'm talking about an a ship after 10 years after 10 years during sea trials it has to perform so a ship performing <coughs> a ship developing full power by the engines full 100% power that mcr the ship speed may not be the full speed because there's so much of wind resistance so much of current resistance so much of hull growth wrapping the hull is dirty barnacle growth so all these resistances will not allow the ship to proceed at full speed even you are making full power on the engines all right okay now the same ship the same ship with hull dirty and all that 
even if you make 90% of the full power on a different occasion, you will find the ship is going more than its full speed. Why? Because you've got the wind behind it and you also got the current behind it. So the ship hardly requires any power to move. So whatever little power you make, the speed that you gain is much more than the maximum speed. So this is the basic understanding of ship's power and ship's speed. It need not always mean that maximum power is maximum speed of the ship. It does not happen always. It may happen if you got the current in your favor, wind in your favor, then you don't even need full power from the engines. You need only part of the power. So these are areas where there is a lot of argument between deck side and engine side. They keep saying, hey, we are not getting enough RPM. How much you cannot get more RPM if the resistance to the ship is more. You may be developing full power, but you're not getting the full RPM. And if you're not getting the full RPM, obviously the ship speed will not be at its full. Okay, so keep this in mind. Okay, next is uh, okay, testing of vessel contractual speed, guaranteed speed, maneuverability. Equipment, safety features are the key functions usually conducted. Next part is who all are there on board the ship when the sea trials is being conducted. Okay. Now, there are four different bodies really, just four. But those four will mean maybe a total of 60, 70 people on board. The biggest group is the shipyard. The shipyard, they have their marine engineers, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, electronic engineers, naval architects, assistants, deck crew, maybe a few engine crew, all will be on board. So almost 40 people come on board for a ship from the shipyard. So they are the ones who are going to actually run the engines. In fact, two, two engineers will be one on each of those. As a, suppose a purifier, the two engineers will be there, one assistant will be there, one electrician will be there just for a purifier. For the auxiliary engine, maybe three engineers, three assistants, three technicians, nine fellows to show you how the auxiliaries work. But when the ship is running, only fourth engineer will be responsible for everything of the generators. So during sea trials, they are going to run the ship, they are going to run the machinery, and while it is running, they will call upon the ship's engineers to see, verify, check, show him how it is run. And then they will ask you to sign that you have seen the item satisfactory. So that is how it is. So for every item, for the boiler, there will be different people. For the purifier, somebody else, generators, uh, fresh water generators, somebody So all of them are come here. Yeah. Only for the main engine, you will have the engine builder's representative. This engine builder's representative, he is actually from Sulzer or BMW or from Mitsubishi or from Watsila, wherever it is. Wherever the engine is coming from, the original fellow will be from that particular workshop. It will not be a local guy. So that is the shipyard. Second one is government governing and certification officials you see the registration of the ship the acceptance of the ship on the records of the government has to be done by the government authorities and government authority here means dg shipping director general shipping now they will delegate authority to the classification society who have been monitoring the building of the ship right from plans Till it is completed. That means every welding, every structure, every frame has gone through the scrutiny of the classification society. In other words, the ship is built to the standards of that particular classification society. And there have been signatories approving of such quality of build. On the basis of this certification, Director General shipping or administration allows registration of the ship and thereby commissioning and assuring and stamping it as a certain ship with 
class standard okay so officially it is a recognized ship based on this recognition the ship owner will get cargo readily for a ship because insurance will also cover it because the ship has been built to the standards certified by the classification society and endorsed by the government then only you have a ship which is accepted otherwise anybody cannot build a ship and expect to carry cargo so government and classification society in conjunction will certify the ship for commissioning third body is the representative of the owners now the owner himself has got 50 ships he is not going to come to your ship to see whether it is satisfactory or not he will authorize the company's senior most people who in turn will get the master and chief engineer to be there first they are number 1 apart from them the fleet manager and cargo uh, engineer superintendent may or may not come on board during sea trials sometimes they do very conscious fellows who are indians abroad they come otherwise they are left in leaving it to the master and chief engineer and the master and chief engineer who are authorized to take ships are very senior people they have a lot of experience years and years of experience and in most probability they have also taken over ships previously for the same company for all the other ships also they have possibility to know so if the chief officer if the chief executive of the company or the owner decides that all the engineers are required on board they will send and during sea trials actually all engineers that is fifth fourth third electrician everybody is there on board so it is for you to only observe what is happening familiarize with yourself because after the sea trial you will be told now i start the purifier and get it filling the tank you should be knowing your subject or start the generator put it on load and you can start the pumps ready for sailing so everything should know that is the period during sea trial when you get familiar with all the machinery without any immediate responsibility at that point of time once the sea trial is over when the shipyard people go away you are left with the engine and machinery room you are now required to operate run maintain whatever so representative of owners is the master and chief engineer and the subordinate that means second engineer third engineer fourth engineer. similarly for the deck side chief officer third officer second officer they also come on board and number 4 last person for during the warranty period the ship builder he will place one engineer on board from their side this engineer is usually the engineer from the main engine construct builders company he may be a german he may be french he may be whatever so he is actually coming from the company that has built the main engines and he comes principally for the main engine but since he is a marine engineer and he also has wide experience on shipboard duty he is on the payroll of the shipyard for taking responsibility for all the equipment on the deck and engine and accommodation and galley for the warranty period so if anything goes wrong the chief engineer or the second engineer informs him suppose for some reason the piston pulling water pump motor has failed so the first thing they will do is inform this guarantee engineer that is i written over the ge he is called the guarantee engineer so we call him we inform him and tell him this is damaged so he makes a note of it so that has to be repaired or replaced by the shipyard subject to the guarantee engineer finding that it is not the neglect of the shipboard engineer that has caused the failure there are a lot of things that fail and if you think a new ship has no problems and it is free from all and you have a pushy time it is a complete misconception 
because most of the teething problem that arise in a ship is during sea trials and immediately after. It may not happen during sea trials. It will happen immediately after because the sea trial process may be for one day or two days. It, I've never heard of three days for sea trial unless there is some major issues that have come up. If there are major issues, the construction is so poor that each time they rectify and again have a sea trial and again it fails. That is very rare. That means the classification society will be suspect because they are the ones that have been monitoring the installation of certified machinery. And if the machinery is certified and approved, it should not fail. Okay. So the four representative or four first uh, groups of bodies which are on board are the shipbuilder, the governing and certification officials, owner's representative, and the guarantee engineer. These are the four. Okay. I hope you are understanding. I am also feeling very, you know, non-stop monologue is very boring. I hope and wish to see you in class, actual classroom. So there I can see your eyes. Here I can see only my laptop. It makes it more interesting in a classroom and you tend to feel a little less sleepy. But when that is going to be, I don't know. Still now there is a bad scenario in Maharashtra and pressure on the rest of the country is again on to keep maintaining COVID norms. That means COVID protection steps like mask and hand washing. Initially, we were required to go to the office five days a week. Now, again, new order has come from DG Shipping that we are supposed to go only two days a week because COVID is again spreading. So the chances of uh, going back to class it seems to be becoming more and more remote. And if I think correctly, if I assume possibly this semester also will be strictly an online semester. So I will never get to see you fellows. This is bad. This is definitely upsetting, unpleasant. Not to see your students. I can't imagine. Anyway, let us move on. We have to move. We have to progress in our subject. So let's see the next part of our sea trials procedure. So you have understood that there will be four groups of people on board the ship. You don't have to mug it up. Just be aware. And it's you know rare that such questions come up in examinations. Because sea trials is the uh, is a rare instance where people get a chance. I have been fortunate and we had, let me tell you about this experience. Our this class is becoming a little monotonous. We took over a ship in Vishakapatnam, Vizag, built by in, uh, Hindustan shipyard. And we had went through the sea trials and we had peel stick engines. Peel stick is a French engine built in Germany. So, main engine was medium speed, V-type. No, no. So, yeah, V-type one engine. Correct. Because there was another ship I had again had peel stick and that one had inline peel stick two engines. This one was peel stick V-type one engine. And it had a horsepower of, I think, 35,000, 35,000 horsepower. Never mind. So, it was a good experience because in Vaisag itself, it was quite messy. There was a fire on the ship while the ship was <laughs> in the stage of construction. So, what happened was, you see, these workers also come on board during painting and making up the accommodation and all that. So we had a fire on board. Unbelievable that a fire on board before the ship is even commissioned. So that fire, why it took place? Our laborers in our country leave a lot to be desired. This fellow, he was 
yeah, the cabins were being set up in the accommodation. The fire was in the accommodation. And yes, I have to mention this. And the fire was in the accommodation of the building of the ship, which was still under construction. So they were still putting the mattresses and beds and uh, doors, etc. This fellow was smoking a biddy, his laborer. And he got a chance to lie down on that Dunlop pillow mattress inside some cabin. And I think he dropped something or he must have fallen asleep. So they get a chance to do that, they will do that. Our laborers are such. And sure enough, that cabin particularly was on fire. And when it was on fire, it is uncontrollable. Nobody thinks that a fire will take place while a ship is being built in a, sh in a shipyard. But the fire was very severe. And believe me, I was, I was, I of course went after the fire has gone and the fire was extinguished because they didn't allow us on board. So they used their fire extinguishers and fire engines came and they put up the fire in the accommodation. And then after the fire, when we went to inspect, we found the bulkheads had buckled. The whole wall, it has buckled. It was a straight steel plate dividing two cabins. But the paneling had burnt out and the plates had buckled. They all bent and twisted. And the portholes, that means the windows, which are made of extruded aluminium, which is resistant to corrosion. They are metal. They are made of extruded aluminium. They resist corrosion. <laughs> These windows, they had melted. And the aluminium, it melted as if they were icicles. You know what are icicles? In caves where it is very cold and the water drips, and the dripping water becomes ice. It's a, they are called stalagmites and stalactites. They are like icicles. So the whole aluminium had melted and they became as if liquid dropping and then solidified. So the aluminium windows had melted. It was such a situation on that ship which was newly being built. So that delayed our taking over. They had to cut up the bulkhead walls and put new plates and weld it up because the steel plates had buckled. And you cannot straighten them by hammering. So they had to be cropped and the whole bulkhead had to be removed and new bulkhead had to be put. So for the windows, they had to remove those aluminium frame windows and put new windows. So. That delayed our stay. So we were there for more than four months in the shipyard guest house. Of course, we used to go in the morning, come back in the evening, good sleep. And once you're back in the guest house, it is like a holiday. Nice guest house, food was given. There was nice in internal games, but within the campus of the shipyard. So it was a pleasant stay. But after we took over, then the problem started. We had a total of 187 odd blackouts. That means the generators kept filling. From, uh, of course, after the shipyard left us, we came first to Kolkata. From Vizak to Kolkata, it was not running at full speed, at medium speed. So there was not much of trouble. What are one or two small problems were there, we solved out. Then from Kolkata, we started out right up to Savannah. Savannah it took about 35 days. And during those 35 days of sailing, the generators failed 180 times. So ultimately, when we reached Savannah, we were exhausted on a brand new ship. So each time, every day or twice a day, three times a day, blackout. And again, you start another generator. What happened was the quotation by the shipbuilder to the ship owner was incorrect. What happened was when actually the shipbuilder also accepted engines made by Kirloskar Cummins as generators and they quoted the lowest price. And the price along with those generators stated that the engines can run on light diesel oil. If it can run on light diesel oil and those generators are actually high speed generators. You cannot use light diesel oil on high-speed generator. You have to use high-speed oil 
for high speed generator but light uh, light diesel oil is cheaper so the quotation was kept low and in the process we engineers on board the ship had to take the brunt of the problems what happened that i have explained to you in our earlier classes heavy fuels take time to burn lighter fuels don't take time to burn similarly there is a classification between high speed diesel and ldo light diesel oil the light diesel oil is a poorer quality of diesel oil as compared to high the high speed diesel so they have quoted that the engines can run on light diesel oil all right and they said each generator can take 750 kilowatts so when we were run, running the engine from the company office we were told that you must run the engine at 750 kilowatts okay we put the engine on 750 kilowatts but was that fuel couldn't burn completely it was having after burning and i'm sure all of you know what is after burning that means by the end of the stroke the fuel is still burning so during that after burning the whole path of flame continued till the funnel and from the top of the funnel at night time we could see what was like an oxyacetylene flame blue flame so each time from the bridge we used to get a call hey what you guys are doing we got a fire on the funnel so we go out of the ship engine room and see on top there is a flame coming out from the funnel instead of smoke we are getting a flame coming out from the funnel and a blue flame that means it is at its highest temperatures so sure enough in the engine room we checked the pipes and we opened a little bit of insulation and we found the pipes were red hot which is a big big hazard a major potential hazard so when we checked the generators we found some of the units there was no valve the valve had burnt out so the exhaust valve could not survive that after burning it simply got burnt out there was no valve left it i think the valve burnt out as gas so that is why each time we had to change the valves and the company kept saying you have to run it at 750 any damage don't worry the shipyard will make for replacement but out at sea the shipyard is not going to come and help you so that is why i say do not assume a new ship will be problem free so each time we had to open up the engines change the valve and again put it and by the time we reached savanna usa there were no valves left on board so special valve was shipped from cummins and cummins is an american company and kirloskar is an indian company so in their collaboration they had made these engines and of course the parts are available in usa and available in india also so ultimately we got more of those valves from usa and by the time we finished we came back to india those engines looked 100 years old those engines looked 100 years old so finally we informed the chief engineer at uh, the shipyard they came and made major changes in the engines everything and then they said you cannot run light diesel oil you will have to use high speed diesel so ultimately they paid the penalty to the company because the difference in the cost of ldo and high speed diesel was significant over a period of years so ultimately they had to pay a penalty in the stan shipyard and ultimately to the government sad so then when we got high speed diesel to run our generators all our problems were solved but for that so many 6 8 months we had a very difficult time okay so let's go on to our next ah uh, i hope now i am a little more awake and i hope you are also a little more awake so i'd like to tell you something about these modern ships that are coming out we are having less and less of seafarers because they are being remote controlled so i have one picture of a remote controlled ship which is here which is not really approved of by various societies by imo by the body of maritime nations because they have their problems which cannot be resolved out at sea so 
and also they are anti social in the sense that they do not provide employment the number of employment also gets reduced but this is a reality this can happen at some stage where there is no accommodation there is no persons on board no room for keeping people on board the ship is completely remote controlled and this is the antenna and the camera that continuously monitor the path the ship is taking and that camera there is going to relay the view it is visible directly to the shipping office so somebody in the shipping office has a screen ahead of him and he is able to control the ship by seeing what is in front of the ship it is similar to controlling the rockets going to mars perseverance is being controlled through computers and automation in usa in a computer laboratory and they are seeing the movements on the screen now shipping also is coming down to those levels where large ships carrying cargo are going to be put across from japan to usa right across the pacific or right across the atlantic without any manpower so it is not a difficult procedure and however there is some restriction to doing these by imo because seafarers are at a tremendous disadvantage <coughs> also it pertains certain problems which could happen out at sea and then there is no person so you will have to put another ship behind to go and find out what is the fault on that ship and rectify it and then allow it to come which means delays additional cost and ultimately the whole prospect and purpose of transporting cargo at a certain speed to reach a destination within a stipulated date is lost so it is not very keenly approved by all sectors of the maritime nations but this is what it looks like what a scary looking ship it is okay let's move on to our sea trials the owner's objective is to ensure a uh, satisfactory attainment of the contractually stipulated ship speed under contractually stipulated weather conditions which are no wind no wave no current deep water smooth hull at contract draft so the contract between them is for a speed with these conditions that means no resistance to the ship almost so the ship builder will have to put in certain parameters which will take account into what the rough weather will contribute to its reduction in speed okay so such conditions are not possible out at sea obviously the sea is not always calm not always windless not always without any current so all these factors have to be taken consideration and certain corrections have to be considered for this reason not only the shaft power and speed are measured but also relevant ship data and environmental conditions all procedures and measurements are made in such a way that the speed is within 0.5 knots and power within 2% so these margins are given you see the theoretical values are obtained by actually using a model a model may be 1 meter or 1 and a half meter long and in proportion to that it will have its beam and draft etc this model is tested in a tank this tank is like a canal and the canal is about 5 meters wide and about 60 meters in length sometimes maybe more also so this is called a towing tank iit kharagpur in their ocean engineering and naval architecture department they have such a tank similarly in vizag shipyard they also have a tank all shipyards will have a towing tank why if a ship is to be built from scratch it is first made in the form of a model the shape something what is calling lalit yadav okay just a minute please. hello yes lalit
आओ हमारा क्लास चल रहा है अभी नहीं हम घर से क्लास ले रहे हैं कंप्यूटर पर ग्यारह दस ठीक है ओके 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 सम मेल डायरेक्टर है सेंट फॉर विच ही वांट्स अ रिस्पांस एनी आई विल सी दैट लेटर तो व्हाट यू थिंक अ मॉडल इज मेड इनिशियली इफ द शिप इज टू बी मेड फ्रॉम स्क्रैच based on that model proportions are calculated and that model is pulled through the towing tank this towing tank is a very special tank and this towing tank has a trolley right across the width of the tank and this has got four electrical motors driving four electrical wheels and there are on rails so right along the entire tank this trolley trolley can move and on the top of this trolley is a complete laboratory complete electronics laboratory and at the center of that laboratory the 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 protrusion rod which is used to tow to the model tie the model and you can see the model and you can see the wave there are cameras all around the underside of that trolley to measure the waves that are being formed when the model is being pulled apart from this the tank which has water in it is capable of creating waves so the waves which are created are resistance to that particular model so the effort required to pull that to, uh, model is immediately recorded electronically all electronic measuring devices are used to study the behavior of that model and calculate the parameters that are involved using those parameters a full full blown ship measurements are obtained and there you give the required conditions the margins which the main ship will have to face out at sea now here there is no wind here there is current yes you can arrange for current but the accuracy will have some differences so there are margins which are put to the main ship which is being built in proportion to a model and after making the ship we still don't know whether the ship given the requisite power will give us the required speed so that is why we need to have sea trials and within the sea trials you will see that there is a difference between what the speed was calculated and what the speed is delivering some margin is acceptable and this margin is 0.05 knots where speed is concerned and only 2% where the power is concerned that means if your ship was intended for 15 knots if it gives you 14.95 knots it is acceptable if it gives you 15.05 knots it is acceptable but beyond these limits of course the contractual obligation may be different from what i have written here it is all up to the ship builder and the ship owner similarly if the power of the engine when they calculate on the indicator card is not performing the required power as calculated in the test bed trials that means in the engine builders workshop it is making 2% less it is acceptable or it is making 2% more which is rare it will never make more it will always make it less because the test bed they try to get the maximum power they can get and using their technology their proficiencies on sea trials you will never get the same value as what you got in the test bed trial so certain corrections need to be have to be considered for this reason not only shaft power and speed are measured but also ship relevant data environment conditions etc that means how much is the wind speed what is the direction of the speed what is the current all these parameters are measured during sea trials another parameter very important is the draft of the sea if the water under the ship is less then the ship will never make full speed the ship has to be in deep water 
to ensure that the speed is able to come to its fullest. Okay. Now let us see during C trials, what are the tests that are taken? See, one thing is during the tests, a lot of people are on board and they already have the program listed out. And what are the tests that are required? The shipyards themselves don't have any idea of what tests are to be taken. It comes from a body which does research, which does testing, which does designing on ships. They are basically naval architects. These naval architect bodies, they also have their engineers, they have their towing tanks, etc. This body is called the International Towing Tank Conference. Okay, there's a message coming. Online training program e-content development by NIITR, Deputy Registrar. Never mind. So this International Towing Tank Conference is a body which decides the way the tests are going to be taken and what are the tests that are going to be taken. Now, I have listed 19 tests. You do not need to know all 19 tests. You need to know two or three at most. A bit in detail of two and three. Remaining, you need to be aware that such tests are also taken for ships, particularly ships of various types. Now, Z maneuver test and Modified Z maneuver, these are for uh, naval ships which have to get out of the way of torpedoes and things like that. So, the Z maneuver is to dodge basically torpedoes and they are not required by cargo ships. But this is a test that is followed out on ships. So, that is why you need to be a little aware that such tests take place. Similarly, most of the tests, I will describe only one or two tests. Number one, turning circle test. Now, this turning circle test is a test where the ship is moving at full speed and then you turn the rudder to hard on port. Once it is turned to hard on port, it does not immediately start turning. It takes a little time. So, once it starts turning, it makes a complete circle. And at each right angle turn, it marks its point, marks its point, marks its point, and then it turns more or less to the original point where it started, more or less, because there is some side movement also. So then they calculate what is the diameter of or the or the turning radius made by that particular ship. So this is recorded in your C trials manual. Similarly, what is the time taken? So I have a diagram here to indicate to you what is a turning circle test. Now, here is the diagram to show you what is the turning circle test. A ship at this point makes its rudder movement hard and poor. Okay. The original path of the ship was straight. So, as it makes its movement to the port, it initially make, goes a little to the right, left and then it starts turning from this point. You notice it does not turn immediately. There is a little difference where the momentum of the ship carries the rudder through even if it is turned. And then the effect, the force on the rudder, it's a movement and then starts turning. So once it starts turning at this point, a record is made. That is the first transfer. Then again, it moves in this direction. That's the second transfer. And then third transfer and then it comes to its full length. So what is the turning radius that has been taken and how much is the displacement from the point it has been. This is called the transfer. That means it has shifted from its original path by the time it has come back to that point. So this is called a turning test. You don't need to have everything to the complete detail, but you need to know what is a turning test in a sorry. What is a turning test, turning circle? The second one is more relevant and it is called measured mile test. That means the ship is put at full speed. Somebody's come over. It's come too late now. Karthik Keshari, what happened? It missed out. Karthik, what happened? He left. 
anyway let's move on so measured mile test is a test which is to check the full speed of the ship how is it done it's very interesting let me show you a diagram with the diagram it becomes easier to explain before i show you the diagram okay let's mind as well show the diagram see the ship is brought out to sea not very far from the coastline now in the diagram you see there is a coastline this is the coastline of course it is not absolutely straight which is acceptable this is a certain distance from the coastline where the water depth is at least two and a half times the maximum draft of the ship okay this maximum draft of the ship has to be at least two and a half times i told you earlier if the depth is shallow then the ship cannot make full speed because there will be a drag on the ship okay now on the coast on the shore you have four masts which are stuck into the ground one is reasonably close to the end of the coastline and absolutely more or less vertically to the coastline another mast is stuck into ground line and these are high masts with the top of the mast very clearly visible and in line with the two masts perpendicular to it in exact distance of one nautical mile another two masts are embedded into the ground so that you have one two three four masts exactly one nautical mile away from each other okay now the ship which is at say this point here is warmed up and already all temperatures are normal at its full requirement and then the engine revs up to its full rpm and it comes at full speed in this path and while it is at this point those ship builder personnel maybe master and technicians they are continuously watching to the port side of the vessel and when these two masts are coming into line that means you have the two masts they come into line gradually when you see one mast they press the stopwatch moment the stopwatch is moved the time starts the time starts and the ship is moving at full speed in this direction or it is seen as it moves it comes up to this point and here again the two masts will come in line once the two masts come in line again they press the stopwatch this stopwatch will stop the watch from clicking further so you have the time period that has been recorded or the distance it has as the ship has moved if on one nautical mile in other words one nautical mile you have so many minutes or half a minute or whatever so based on that you get the maximum speed but this maximum speed is not the correct figure why because there might be a wind head wind there might be a current so what do we do we allow the ship to continue further and make a u turn as it makes a u turn again it comes from that side at full speed and when it comes at this point again you press the stopwatch to see that the two masts are in line and the ship again continues at full speed and it is this point and then you again use the stopwatch so you have two different timings for one nautical mile based on this you calculate the average figure and this is done multiple times till a accurate figure is achieved so for 100% it is done maybe five or six times similarly for 85% 75% 50% percent, 30% of the load again it is calculated so ultimately you get a graphical representation of what is the load and what is the speed at various loads you get what is the speed maximum speed so that is how graphs are plotted and this is the measured mile test okay these are called williamson turn that they are like u turns they go off the path and then make a u turn and come in a straight line and they come this way then again they go off the path make a u turn and again come there so remember the name williamson turns how will you remember just remember captain of the new zealand team when you are doing sea trials think of the captain of the new zealand team ken williams we will do a williamson turn Okay, so that is 
measured mile test. These are the two important tests. And one more test I will tell you is important. And that is called the crash top. But before we go to that, let's read over our Z maneuver test, modified Z maneuver test. These are to dot torpedoes and they are mainly intended for uh, defense vessels. So direct spiral test, reverse spiral test, pull out test, stopping test, stopping inertia test, man overboard test. Stopping test is an important one. What they do is come at a full speed and they cut off the engines. And they see from the point of cutting off the engine to the point when the ship actually comes to a stop, how much time is taken and what distance is covered. That would be called a stopping test. Okay. Other than this, you have parallel course, maneuver test, initial turning test, accelerating turning test, thrusters test, grabbing test. Even I don't know the details of these tests and I don't remember performing these tests on that ship when we went for sea trials. Those, these tests are for different types of ships that come about. ITC, ITTC has a list of tests which are conducted for sea trials and this is that list. You don't have to mug up all the tests. Okay. So next, what we have is the crash top. This crash top is a relevant test and it is there for all cargo ships. In fact, it is there for all ships. So what is this crash top? The crash top is intended to save the ship from, my God, we got only 10 minutes. Okay, save the ship from collision. And how do you do it? You don't have to do it. There is a program, a computer program built into the system, which is there on the control panel of the engine room. And it is covered with a glass box. This glass box has to be removed and the button has to be pressed. A similar button is there on the bridge. The bridge and engine control room have the same buttons to facilitate the crash top. During crash top, the whole system is programmed by the computer. You have to sit back and watch. You don't do anything. What really happens is, moment you press that button, the entire safety arrangement for the main engine is cut off. In other words, the main engine will continue to run irrespective of what you what mishap takes place. If there is no lube oil, doesn't matter. Engine will continue to perform the program as stipulated in the crash top. If there is no cooling water, doesn't matter. If the cooling water temperature is very high, doesn't matter. So all safety bypass of the main engine is by stop, is bypassed, and the engine will perform what has been ordered by the crash top signal. And what is that signal? The first thing that will happen, I'm telling you about my own experience, so it is absolutely for fail proof. The main engine, which is a medium speed engine, generally has a clutch system. The clutch system is driving the propeller. So the clutch system is first disengaged. The engine is stopped. Moment you cut off the fuel, engine is supposed to stop. But if the clutch is on, the engine will keep rotating because the whole ship and the mass of the ship will be dragging the whole propeller. So the propeller in the water will be turning and this will cause the engine to also rotate in the same direction. So the first thing that has happened is the clutch is disengaged. Moment the clutch is disengaged, the propeller keeps turning because the propeller is being dragged by the mass of the ship having its own momentum. But the engine will stop immediately, hardly a few seconds, engine will stop. Then the engine is reversed, started in the reverse direction. While it is moving in the reverse direction, the clutch is again engaged. So you see, the engine is moving in one direction, the clutch which is attached to the propeller is moving in the opposite direction. So there's a lot of resistance within that. In the process, there's a lot of smoke in the engine room. There's smoke, there's alarm, fire alarm, there's noise, everything is there. And after some time, maybe 10 to 15 seconds, the clutch holds. So there is no relative movement between the engine and the propeller. So once it's hold, the propeller starts reverting in the opposite direction. And then more fuel is given to the engine. It is programmed. And the propeller starts moving in the astern direction at a faster speed. 
this rotation in the astern direction helps to reduce the the forward movement of the ship it creates a braking effect so that braking effect reduces or stops the ship quickly as compared to what it would have happened if there was no braking effect if the propeller was continued to rotate in the same direction but you stop the engine it will not stop within the same distance as what it would if you have the propeller rotating in the opposite direction so that helps to stop that ship from having a collision the idea is it doesn't make sense to protect the engine and at the same time have a collision that collision may cause the whole ship to sink so what good is your engine so your engine must be used to the maximum to stop that collision so that you save the ship even at the cost of damaging your machinery so that is what is the crash stop about that is the whole idea of a stop stop the ship at any cost something may come up because that crash may cause the ship to sink and the consequences are very very heavy all right and this crash stop is to be manually operated so you have a you have to make up your mind whether you need it and it is generally done during sea trials only once there are reverse crash stop also crash stop a head test what you see there is a crash stop astern also which most ship owners will say not required but it is there it is there as per specification of ittc you don't it is unlikely for a ship to have a moving backwards and hit something that is rarely run backwards in a ship the so next one is what you have oh okay so those are the tests that you have and are stipulated by ittc you need to know only two the three one is the turning circle test one is the measured mile test and one is the crash stop test the others are purely academic at the start of the trials engines are first warmed up and crank web engine the deflections are taken and recorded these will be in variation to test bed trial record you see crank web deflections are dependent on the accuracy of the crankshaft axis if there is uneven seating of the crankshaft in the main bearings then your crank web will start moving in and out so initially crank web deflections are taken in the shop trial that is where the engine is manufactured there the readings will be very very accurate there will be almost 100% accuracy in the accurate axis of the crankshaft now when that engine is brought and put on the ship the bed plate is not a solid floor it has some amount of flexibility so the bed plate will also have some flexibility which will accommodate the movement of the tank top so your crank web deflections will be definitely different from what was found in the test bed so these are recorded in the manual as before sea trial crank web deflection readings these are for reference okay second is fuel consumption guarantee for main engine is always given on the basis of measurements taken at the shop trials only at the builders workshop the fuel consumption during sea trials is for referral verification only okay so when a quotation is made the quotation is made to the ship engine builder by the shipyard not by the ship owner the shipyard does the dealing with the with the engine manufacturer the ship owner uh, has nothing over here he has a later dealing with the ship engine builder but the ship builder and the engine builder they come into a contract and the engine builder tell the ship builder my fuel consumption is 167 grams per kilowatt hour what you do with the engines where you place the engine is not my point my point is what i found in my test bed so that is the fuel figure of the test bed trial now when you put the engine on board the ship the fuel consumption is different so the fuel consumption is measured here again and recorded and these will be the reference values for the chief engineer to compare in future okay so this will be all for today you have come to page 
in our next class, we will start with 11 and finish the rest. Okay. So as of now, we have 29 guys on board. So I don't know how for 29 now. We are supposed to have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 27, 28. 30, 32, 32, and over here I see 29, so actually 27, so there are five guys who have ducked out, who are those five guys, let me find out, so they will pay a heavy penalty now, I don't think they're ducking out, so 108 is there, okay, well, then Muhammad Azaruddin, again your number, 109, 109, okay, yes sir, Okay, let me start from the bottom. 116, 116 is there, okay. 115 is there. As I keep calling, you can move on because I've already taken 11, it's almost 1111. So as I keep calling, you can move on. 11, 8116 is gone, 8115 is gone, 8113. 8113 is there, 8112 is there. Then 811, 8111 is there. Then 8110, 810, 810 is there. Okay. Then 809, 109 is there. 108 is there. One, uh, Manish Kumar Yadav, or your uh, 8106? 107, sir. Manish Kumar, oh, there is Manish Kumar and Manish Kumar Yadav. Okay, 107 is there, 106 is there, 105 is there. 104 is there, 103 is there, 103. Then uh, Kundan Kumar Sharma, you are 102. Yes, sir. Okay. Then 101, then 800, then 98, okay, 97. Uh, Khalid Yaya Ahmed, you are 97. Yes, sir. Good. 96 is uh, Kirtan Sina. Okay, he's there. 95 is Karutha, Karutharan. Yes, sir. 8095, sir. 95. Very good. Oh. I, will, I will send all you guys one new notice that has come. It is come from headquarters. And I'm going to send it to all the boys to make you aware how concerned the institute is regarding your attendance. I'll send it to you with this link and read that. I, I don't want to go start reading that in front of you. So 904 is there and 90 is missing. So 86 is there. Uh, 86, 85. 85, 85 is there. Because the ones that are not taking off, I will be marking them absent. Imanish Mukherjee, what is your number? 804? 88 is not there. 88 is vanished. Similarly, 90 has vanished. So they will be marked absent. 83. Sir, sir there are 8 cadets who have their NCC camp today. See, I know Haran, I, they are not there in task. They will have to write a letter saying that we are required to attend NCC camp. For this, you have to give us exemption. They will be given exemption, but they have to be honest with the whole purpose. That's all. They will be given. But from my side, who is present, he is marked present. Who is absent, who is marked absent. I can't write over there NCC in your attendance. There's no scope for me to write that. You should be able to understand. So 81 is there. Where is 82? 82, 8082. Now the disappearing trick. Okay. Eight one is there. Eight zero is also no? eight zero is there. Yes. Seventy nine has where is seventy nine? He's on it. Seventy eight is there. Okay, that's all. So I will repeat the names who are not there. Seventy nine is missing. Eighty two is missing. Eighty eight is missing. Ninety is missing. Otherwise, everybody else is there. Yes. So one, two, three, four, one fellow more is missing. I'm not able to catch him. Okay, anyway, he's got through. Let him go. No problem. I'm not nitpicking. 
but the pressure i get from the headquarters is very severe so that is why we will be a little strict about this attendance in future